Good afternoon to those of you who are in Europe and Africa. Good evening to those of you that are in Asia. Good morning to those of you that are in the Americas. And welcome to this launch for John Ruster's book, China's Great Road, Lessons for Marxist Theory and Socialist Practices, co-hosted by Friends of Socialist China, the Tricontinental Institute for Social Research, The Morning Star, the Geopolitical Economy Research Group, and Learning from China. My name is Carlos Martinez, and I will be chairing and introducing today. And to the audience for making the effort to be with us today. I think it's really important that we take this book seriously, that we read it, that we discuss it, and that we debate it. The questions that it seeks to answer are among the most important questions in global politics. China has made this incredible, this extraordinary progress, this much most people can agree on. China in 1949, at the time of the founding of the People's Republic, was literally one of the poorest countries in the world. Famines were a regular occurrence. The vast majority of people didn't have access to basic healthcare, modern energy, and clean water. Since then, China's situation has improved pretty much beyond recognition. There are no more famines. Life expectancy has more than doubled. Extreme poverty has been eliminated. Everybody eats. Literacy is universal. Every child gets at least nine years compulsory education. And living conditions continue to improve all the time. In an enormous country with a population of 1.4 billion people, these achievements really are incredible. And the key questions for us here and now are, how has China achieved these successes? And what lessons are there to learn for humanity? And these are questions that really aren't discussed very much outside China, particularly in the West. The literature on China is frankly farcical for the most part. There are dozens of books devoted to slandering the Communist Party of China, to discussing its putative authoritarianism, recycling Cold War tropes, or engaging in you know, amateur psychological analysis of Xi Jinping and so on. In as much as the Western mainstream has anything positive to say about China's economic success, it's that while well, China gave up on socialism in 1978 with Deng Xiaoping's reforms, and since then it's gone on to do really well, and this is all the proof you need that socialism is bad and capitalism is good. Now, there are two glaring logical fallacies here. First, actually, as John points out in his book, the period from 1949 to 1978, i.e. the first three decades of socialist construction before the reform period, actually witnessed the greatest improvement in a country's living standards in history. And this is an unfashionable point to make, but we have to talk about it nonetheless. Life expectancy increased from around 36 to 67. The population doubled. Famine became a thing of the past. Basic healthcare was extended to the entire country for the first time. Primary education was extended to all children for the first time. Now, in terms of GDP growth, period was sort of good but not amazing. But GDP growth doesn't capture the fact that society was very strongly focused on the production of use values rather than exchange values. It wasn't a commodity society. So in as much as it isn't deemed an economic success, we're really talking in a capitalist framework. But for ordinary people, economic success is measured much more in terms of their quality of life, on which basis the initial period of socialist construction was certainly a big success. And the second logical fallacy is that, well, if capitalism is the key to economic success, why haven't the other capitalist countries of the developing world done so well? Why is China alone responsible for three quarters of global poverty reduction in the last four decades? Why hasn't India had that success or Latin America or Africa had similar levels of success? You know, maybe it's that China's more capitalist than other countries, but you know, given the central role of the state in the Chinese economy, that would be a pretty difficult point to argue. John's book actually makes it abundantly clear that the exact opposite is the case. China has achieved what it's achieved precisely because it's a socialist country, precisely because the capitalist class isn't allowed to dominate political power in China, precisely because the interests of capital don't come before the interests of the people, as is the case in capitalist countries. And that really is an extremely important thing for humanity to understand, and it has very far-reaching consequences. So John's book is an essential text for understanding modern China. As I said, let's read it and let's debate it. We've got some really interesting speakers today, and I'm sure each of them will have important insights to share. And I hope we'll have some disagreement and some divergence as well. 
I think you know the overall the the overarching message of the book we can all agree on, and we should be seeking to disseminate and to popularize that, i.e., that socialism works, that Chinese socialism works, and that there are many lessons that other countries can learn. But the book also includes contributions and ideas in relation to contentious, ongoing debates within the left about what socialism is and what constitutes a viable global strategy for Marxists in the 21st century. Um, you know, these are these are key topics to explore, and there's a lot more work to be done on them. And among the panelists here, there'll certainly be some differences of opinion, some differences of perspective. So I'm sure we can discuss and debate these issues in a respectful and comradely manner and in a spirit of unity. So with those remarks out of the way, I'll just quickly describe the format of today's webinar. First up, John is gonna introduce the book for up to 15 minutes, after which each of the speakers is gonna have around eight minutes each. We've got the Q&A box open for the audience to ask any questions they might have. And hopefully we'll have time after the presentations for a round of discussion based on those questions, plus anything that might have come up earlier. The idea is to keep the whole event to around 90 minutes. I'm sure we can manage that or something near it. So that's housekeeping out of the way. I'd now like to introduce our first speaker, John Ross, who is the author of the book we're here to discuss. John is Senior Fellow at Chongyang Institute for Financial Studies at the Renmin University of China. He's author of over 500 published articles on China's economy and politics. From 2000 to 2008, he was Director of Economic Policy for the Mayor of London, and he is a co-founder of the No Cold War campaign. Welcome, John. Um, just so you know, I'm going to set my phone, phone alarm for 15 minutes time. If you hear beeping in the background, take that as a sign to start wrapping up. Go for it, John. Okay, first, I'd like to thank everybody for coming and particularly to thank the speakers. And you have to start off with a book presentation with um, a lot of thanks. Uh, the main ones are, in this case, in China, or the original ones. It's a great privilege that the book, the great part of the book was originally published in Chinese and it reflects the discussions in Chongyang Institute where I work and the uh, at guancha.cn, which is the main Chinese web center-left website, in my opinion, the most important non-state center-left website in the world, which gets tens of millions of hits every day and carries huge debates uh, within the Chinese left. So therefore, I, one thing from the book that you should understand is it gives you a bit of a flavor of the debates which are taking place inside China, because the original parts of the book were written for a Chinese audience. Secondly, I have to thank very much the staff of 1804 Books in the US who did all the editorial work. And I've got to thank Kenny Coyle personally very much for producing the um, UK edition. Without that, the, these things, the book couldn't have appeared. All right, what, what's the purpose of the book? The first purpose is to outline the sheer scale of what China's achievement is and what is its consequences for humanity and for socialists. The conclusion it will arrive at is very simple. China is today the most important question for socialists in the world. Indeed, everybody recognizes one of the most important questions in the world, but particularly for socialists. Not only for China itself, but for its interconnection with other uh, countries. We got a graphic illustration of this a few days ago at the conference of the CPC and World Political Parties. Um, and which you had the leading, the speaker, the leading parties and the heads of government or state of over 20 countries speaking at that, in particular, Argent particular countries in the global south, Argentina, Cuba, Vietnam, uh, Namibia, South Africa, just to name a few. And this is an incredible interaction, therefore, that takes place between China and particularly the global south. But also, what the question of the development of China poses at least three enormous questions. In addition to China itself, can other countries replicate China's success? We have to understand what the scale of China's success is. In 1949, China was almost the poorest country in the world. If you take the data of Angus Madison, who was the, the world's top expert on long-term economic growth, there are only 10 countries in the world which were, had a lower per capita GDP than China. China, by, by its own internal standards, has reached what it calls most moderate prosperity, but let's, to make international comparisons, use World Bank criteria for a high-income economy. China will become a high-income economy 
in either 2022 or more probably 2023. What that means that in only just over 70 years, in a single lifetime, China will have gone from almost the poorest country in the world to a uh, high income economy, which is not important million income, but it, all the choices in life, life expectancy, culture, education, health and everything in life. That's in a single lifetime. If the 84% of the population which lived in the developing countries could achieve that, then very many of the problems in the world would be solved. So the first question is, can, is it something specific and unique only to China or can other countries replicate China's success? Secondly, what are the implications of this enormous fact for Marxist theory? And thirdly, as a subsidiary question, why did the USSR collapse when China succeeded? In order to deal with these questions, I'd just like to start by recalling a, a very famous Chinese saying, which says, seek truth from facts. It, this is very, very famous. If you go to the party school of the CPC in Yan'an, you can find it in Mao Zedong's own, uh, own handwriting. It appears in the CPC party school today, and it is in, on the campus of many Chinese universities. This reflects a simple fact. In very serious matters, you cannot cheat facts. You cannot cheat reality. There is no virtue in optimism. There is no virtue in realism. There is only uh, no virtue in, in pessimism. There is only a virtue in realism. That is the conclusion of this. And we have to remember, of course, that many of the leaders of the CPC of the first generation, Mao Zedong, Deng Xiaoping uh, and, and others, were themselves military commanders. Um, you had to be realistic there because if you weren't realistic, you probably ended up dead. So that ended, that taught a great deal of realism in that. Right, okay. We also have to understand the scale of the class struggle which took place in China between 1839 and 1949, approximately 100 million people died as a result of foreign interventions, of civil wars created by foreign interventions, of famines created by these, uh, by, by these civil wars. This is, in sheer quantitative terms, the largest class struggle in a country, single country, which has ever taken place in human history. Of course, other countries have had proportionately equal ones, but it shows you the enormous struggle which took place to create the People's Republic of China. If we apply this model, this question of seek truth from facts, the first thing we have to do is establish what are the facts that have got to be explained and which are so enormous. The first is the question of the elimination of poverty in China. Again, if you take the World Bank definition of poverty, 853 million people have been lifted out of poverty in China. To give you an idea of what that means, that is almost twice the population of the entire European Union. It is bigger than the entire population of Latin America. This is the greatest social achievement, in my opinion, probably in the whole of human history and certainly in contemporary uh, period. Furthermore, it's three out of four people lifted out of poverty in the world. Carlos already mentioned the question about this. What is the implications of this? We have to say very fundamentally what type of social system could produce such an alleviation of poverty. If it was capitalism, as some people claim, some mostly on the right, but some on the left, you would have to draw an appropriate conclusion. Capitalism remains a progressive system capable of great social achievements. Uh, and uh, socialism is perhaps a bit premature. The reality, of course, is exact opposite. China itself represents 75% of the reduction in world poverty by well-being standards, and socialist countries in, in Indochina represent another 3%. That means 78% of the people lifted out of World Bank to find poverty in the world were lifted out in socialist countries, only 22% in capitalist countries, despite the fact that the capitalist countries have much bigger population than China or the other socialist countries, uh, more, more than twice, in fact. So in other words, the first conclusion we can draw from this is it's socialism that, draw, that takes people out of poverty. That's the first thing. Secondly, China has produced the uh, 
most rapid economic growth in the whole of world history from 1978 to 19 uh, to 2020 that's 42 years the average growth in china was 9.2 percent i find it rather funny because i sometimes read in the financial times when they say it's decades since the western countries achieved such growth rates this is factual nonsense they never achieved such growth rates china is simply the fastest growth in economic in in economic in world history again what system produced this is a fundamental question okay if you look at the interrelation with the global south china finds itself now in alignment with an increase in discussion with countries such as uh, brazil bolivia venezuela many countries in africa those are two questions of that. One is the practical interrelation between China and the countries of the global south. And the second is what can be learned from China's experience. Okay. Confronted with such enormous facts, the first attempt that is made is to attempt to deny these facts. Um, I'm going to deal with just one of them, um, again, which was mentioned previously, which is the Mao period. When I was writing the book, I wanted to study this very carefully because the issue is so serious you can't cheat on it. And I wanted to investigate two possible hypotheses. One was that the period of the planned economy in the in China, the Soviet plant type planned economy under Mao was more successful than it was generally thought. And the conclusions that I came to on that was, it is true that it was more successful than is portrayed, but it was not a dramatic economic success. It achieved during the periods of growth leaving aside the periods of the Cultural Revolution, the Great Leap Forward, about 6%. It never achieved the growth rate of China after 1978. Secondly, there were two great disruptions of this, the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution, which the Chinese Communist Party regards as great mistakes, and all the research that I did confirmed that. But what astonished me and dumbfounded me almost was the social achievements of this period, in, during the period of Mao Zedong's period, the average life expectancy in China increased by 31 years in a 27 year period. If you want to know why Mao Zedong has the authority that he does, and love is the best way to express it, the Chinese people, contrary to all the lies which appear in the West, you have to understand, in addition to the question of achieving national liberation, getting foreign armies out of China, if someone leads you to live 31 years longer than you expect, you tend to feel very well disposed towards them. And indeed, this is the undoubtedly the biggest social miracle in human history. So that's the two things I would say in the book. The, the Mao period, there is some denigration on the economic sphere in the West, but the most decisive thing, excessive one, but the most decisive thing is the gigantic social miracle and the improvement of the conditions of the Chinese people. Okay. If that's the attempts to deny this, and it's therefore very necessary to refute um, all, 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 the, all these facts. Um, a third thing which is posed is what explains all this? What is its implications for Marxist theory? It is clear that after 1978, China departed somewhat from the Soviet model, which was, let's say, established after 1929, and, and did this in a number of ways. Uh, it decollectivized agriculture, introducing the household responsibility system, and it opened up the economy to foreign trade. Uh, it, what it didn't do was it did not, it didn't uh, privatize the decisive sector of the economy. It is still the case that 40% of the investment in China today is carried out by the state sector, and its economy is controlled by raising or lowering this state sector of the economy. Was, was were these changes that were carried out by china were they a deviation from marx or were they bringing it closer to marx the conclusions that i would give in the book is if we look at what marx himself wrote not what other people said marx wrote what china did brought it closer to the positions of marx marx wrote in the communist manifesto the, the proletariat will use its political power to political supremacy to wrest by degree all capital from the bourgeoisie, to centralize all instruments of production in the hands of the state, i.e., of, of the proletariat organized as the ruling class, and to increase the total productive forces as rapidly as possible. Note by degree. 
Marx therefore envisaged a period during which both state property and non-state property would exist. And there's a fundamental reason for this. What is the origins of the word socialism? It derives from socialized, large scale. But agriculture in general is not socialized and particular low development of agriculture. It's individual production. The attempts therefore to forcibly collectivize agriculture in the Soviet Union, whatever might have been their political or geopolitical reason in 1929, were not close to Marxist economics. Secondly, the uh, development, the largest socialized production in the world is globalized production. And therefore, again, the attempt to create a self-contained economy within the Soviet Union was a mistake. And China, by opening up its economy after 1978, created the conditions in which it could benefit from massive social uh, uh, socialization production. I, I don't have any confusion in this. This doesn't mean that all forms of globalization, and particularly capitalist globalization, etc., are correct. But it corresponds to Marx's ideas of socialization of production as it was carried out by China. So, so therefore, the conclusion that outlined in the book, I can only deal with that very briefly, is that what China did was not a deviation from Marx. It actually brought the Chinese economy closer to the economic structure that was envisaged by Marx in the Communist Ma Manifesto, in Capital, and into the critique of the Gotha program. Finally, what's the significance of all this for other countries in addition to China? It is my profound belief that the because precisely it corresponds to Marxist theory, nobody, of course, can mechanically copy China. They, that China would be first to say this. But other countries can learn from this and apply some of the basic rules and ba or basic forms of development. We've already seen this in Vietnam, which is also another spectacular economic success. Laos was another spectacular economic success. These have very, very close to what is actually China's economic model. But I would also pay attention to Bolivia. Bolivia had the most successful economic development during the pink tide in, uh, as it was so-called in Latin America. And Bolivia's was the economic model, which came closest to China's. It wasn't exactly the same as China's, and, but nevertheless, the key things which existed there was that you had the state ownership of the key, key parts of the economy, but in the in case of Bolivia, the nat natural resources. You had a very high level of state investment and you had a very successful economic policy. It was, was because this economic policy was so successful that in my opinion, when confronted with the anti-democratic coup uh, to get rid of Evo Morales, the Bolivian people fought back and overturned the coup because they knew that they had been living better during that period of time. So therefore, I also know there's discussions taking place in Venezuela, in Brazil and other countries on this. So therefore, the final conclusion that would draw in the book is exactly the fact that it is vital for socialists throughout the world to discuss the issues which exist in China and in order to learn from, not to mechanically copy, but to learn from them. So therefore, I have, in a very brief period of time, I hope I've outlined what are some of the key things which in the book, and I hope you also give you a bit of insight into the economic discussion and the political discussion which actually takes place in China. Thank you very much. Thank you, John, for that very thought-provoking and, dare I say, information-dense contribution. Um, so our next speaker is Dai Suyue. Suyue is a senior editor at Guancha.cn, uh, which John referenced in his speech. Um, it's one of the most popular and influential news and analysis websites in China, and it was actually the original publisher for quite a few of the articles in John's book. Su Yue isn't able to be with us live today, but she sent a pre-recorded video, which I am now going to share. Hi, everyone. I'm so glad that I could have this chance to say something at this important moment. First of all, please allow me to express my heartfelt congratulations on the international launch of Ms. John Rose's new book, China's Great Road. I am an editor from Guanchata.cn, which is one of the most influential media platforms in China. As an editor, I have worked with John for more than two years. 
We are very honored that the Chinese version of the majority of the articles in this book is firstly published on our website. From 2010 to 2021, which is the time span of this book, my colleagues and all the readers of Guancha have followed hundreds of John's articles and we together experience a series of events which deeply changed China and the world situation. From G20 to the Belt and Road Initiative, from the election of Trump to the new Cold War, from the sanction of Huawei to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Every time detailed data and graphs and his professional analysis to make accurate judgments and further predictions. In this way, John has become one of the most respected and popular authors among Chinese readers. Every of his article will get millions of hits on Chinese cyberspace. And his articles have affected or even changed many people in China. I still remember in 2019, during the road in Hong Kong, that Western forces attempted to copy the practice of the color revolution in Hong Kong. Many young people in Hong Kong were deeply influenced by Western propaganda and believed that their violence was fighting for freedom. One day, I received a message from a reader. She said her son was a Hong Kong middle school student, and unfortunately, he has become one of the young people who agreed with violence and the separatism. To make matters worse, he even didn't believe any news and articles in Chinese words because he thought that could be communist uh, propaganda. His mother read John's article on the Hong Kong situation and hoped we could give her the convince her boy to know the truth. In the end, after reading John's article and after his own observation and thinking, this boy finally realized what was really happening in Hong Kong and began to understand the policy of the central government. I think this true story can tell us why John's research and articles are so important to not only us Chinese people, but also much more people living out of China. During these 10 years, the rise of China is an undeniable fact for the world. But different people, different forces have different interpretations of this fact. We can see Western countries, represented by the US, usually explain the secret of China's development as being a, a free rider or violating human rights, which is apparently ridiculous. What they want to cover up to the world's people is the true reason for China's success, which we can see directly from the title of this book. That is, China insisting on the Marxist theory and socialist practice. However, in today's world, it is quite difficult for ordinary people to know the answer behind China's achievement. Instead, they are usually surrounded by bias, fake news, ideological attack, and the forecast of China collapse, which created by the so-called international mainstream media. That is also a very tough challenge for China. On our long road of building socialism and the human community, we need more understanding, more cooperation, and more and more friends. But the information gap and our relatively weak capability of international communication make it hard for people to get first-hand information and object, objective analysis. During the, ten, during the past 10 years, Guan Cha has tried to make every effort to change such a reality. In 2008, we started as a collection of several intellectuals who had the same beliefs, and now we have more than 200 colleagues and uh, the top three influential rate in China. We also have a strong alliance of a lot of brilliant international colonists like John and several other friends in today's meeting. I believe this, either, the, I believe this alliance will be much bigger 
and stronger with the development of the war situation. In the end, I want to thank Mr. John Rose again. As he wrote in this article, it is very pleasant that the English version of this book could be available as well as the Chinese version. I believe all the first-hand statistics, professional observation, and insightful analysis we can find in this book will, to some extent, solve the difficulty I mentioned above and help people around the world, especially those from global south, to overcome the information gap created by Western countries and get to know about China's road. And Guancha will always be proud of, of our role in such an encouraging course. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dai Su Yue. Um, right, next up we have Kenny Coyle. Kenny is the founder of Praxis Press, which is a publisher of books on Marxism and socialist history. He's based in Macau, China, and has lived in Hong Kong and Macau for nearly 20 years. He is the author of China's New Era and What It Means, and is a regular contributor to the Morning Star newspaper. Kenny, are you available? I hope so. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I've got you. So um, if you can keep to around eight minutes, after eight minutes, you'll hear some uh, some beeping from my phone, and that will be a uh, 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 signal to start wrapping up. Great. Okay, thank you, Carlos. Um, well, greetings from, from Macau, the, uh, the second special administrative region of the People's Republic. Um, I'd like to begin by obviously thanking John for his help on getting the, the British edition of China's Great Road, um, getting it ready in record time. It's the quickest book Praxis Press has ever been involved in. And also giving us the chance um, to add in a, a special preface to the, to the British edition. And I'd also like to thank uh, the comrades in New York at 1804 Books for all their technical help, the design, the layout, the formatting of the files and so on. Um, again, that made a huge difference in um, getting the, the British edition into, into print as quickly as, um, as quickly as we did. Um, John's book is very important for a whole number of reasons. I'll, I'll try and stick to the ones which I think are um, the most significant. Uh, the first one is that it's written from the perspective of Marxism. And that reason alone makes it stand out from the overwhelming majority number of, of titles and commentaries that you have on China. And I think that John's approach specifically uh, is one that marries the, the kind of disciplines or sub-disciplines of Marxist political economy and historical materialism. Um, and that gives John's book a number of advantages over any comparable book. The first is that it places uh, the critical role of the state and political agency, um, specifically the Communist Party of China, uh, center stage. And the second, really, I think, very, very significant factor in the book is that unlike 99% of books written about China, uh, including those written by people who would, might regard themselves as Marxists, John actually takes seriously the Communist Party of China as a Communist Party, as a party that's guided by Marxism as a party whose policies and strategies are informed and inspired by Marxism. And that's very unusual. That's a very, very rare category of, of uh, literature as far as China's concerned. Um, I think that allows the book, um, and I think readers will get this straight away, is, that it, is the ability to see China's development um, not just in terms of its historical and comparative uh, perspectives, um, but also to look at it in a, a theoretical terms, um, principally the question of where we locate China in terms of its own transition process towards socialism. The Communist Party in China uses the term the, 
the primary stage of, of socialism. And John um, goes into that in some detail quite early on in the book. Uh, there's a, a section there, but it's it's all it's you can find references to primary stage of socialism all the way through the book. Um, and I think that's one of the most uh, important elements of the CPC's strategy, its understanding. Um, and John remarked there earlier about um, the, the famous quote from Marx about resting by degrees, this question of um, no, no question of an overnight transition to socialism. The, the, I think the Chinese phrase is the, uh, the rash advance. The periods of the rash advances in Chinese history have usually been quite disastrous. It's the steady build up, the cumulative growth of, uh, of China's economy that is, is what's really the most important. I think also um, taking that into consideration, it's a, a, a reminder really of Marx's famous remark to the effect that human beings make their own history, but they do so in circumstances that are not of their own choosing, that they inherit um, circumstances from transmitted from the past. Um, because that's ignored by very many uh, self-styled Marxist commentators on, on China's development. Um, Marx, after all, had talked about the transition from capitalism to socialism, but China had a much more complicated background. Uh, China was a semi-colonial, semi-feudal society um, throughout the first half of the, the, uh, the 20th uh, century. So by the time of the revolution in 1949, it, developed, it, it uh, inherited one of the weakest economic bases in, uh, in the world, as, as John has, has said. So I think that his historical perspective is a very necessary one. I think also um, probably one of the first things I read or studied of John's was uh, one of his early works uh, when he was in Russia and uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And I think that John's experience in witnessing the chaos and collapse of um, Russian society, the Russian economy in the 1990s is a really important um, counterweight to those who argue rather simplistically that, that China too has undergone some kind of capitalist counter-revolution at some point. The divergent experiences of the Russian people and the Chinese people couldn't be, couldn't be more different. I think also John brings into play the importance of the, the weight of China's growth in terms of the global economy. And I think this is very, very interesting. It's something I think which we're all very, very aware of. Uh, I think John does a great job in, in just emphasizing just how critical this, this is in terms of the opportunities for, um, for other countries. He mentioned um, Bolivia, Venezuela, and so on. The opportunities that are opening up both uh, economically, diplomatically, um, and I think also ideologically for the left as a result of China's rise by putting an end to this uh, US hegemony, this uh, unipolar world that um, they tried to construct after 1990. This is gonna have a tremendous effect. Um, it's not surprising there's maybe a lot of confusion at the moment among the left internationally. They don't understand China. Uh, it seems to be a very far away experience, um, especially people in the Western left, and I'm, I mean specifically the Northern, uh, North, uh, Northern American and uh, West European left. The experiences of people in Africa and Asia and Latin America are very, very alien to us. And it's only really by immersing yourself in, in other kinds of societies that you begin to, to understand just how uh, phenomenal China's achievement has actually been. Um, I don't want to use up my whole eight minutes. I hope I'm not where, nowhere near using that. But I just wanted to end on one other uh, point, which I think, again, um, is a really, uh, a really important point about the book. Um, it, it's, John has brought together an immense amount of research, uh, statistics, tables, data from a whole variety of sources. And in a period when there is a determined attempt to promote a kind of China skepticism, where everything about Chinese statistics or Chinese realities is considered suspect 
in the West. The idea that China's deceiving the world about its economic growth or its COVID response or its vaccination rates or, or whatever. These are, these are becoming very deeply rooted. So it's very important, I think, that we are able to fight back with uh, powerful empirical um, counter arguments to that. And John's book is a fantastic resource uh, for doing that. And I think also uh, what John does rather brilliantly, I think, is to bring together these very dry statistics and to put them into human terms, to talk about the, the doubling of life expectancy, to talk about the, the drops in uh, infant mortality, the expansion of education and so on. So there's a human dimension to China's uh, development. And I think that's something maybe that uh, the left in the West needs to do a, bit, a little bit more of, rather than simply to talk about China's growth in terms of GDP or, or what have you. It's how this has transformed the lives of 1.4 billion people for the better. Uh, that's the real lesson, I think, of China's great road. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kenny. And I think that's um, what you started with was a really key point for me and something that I hadn't particularly thought about that while there are lots of books written about the Chinese economy, what really distinguishes John's book or one of the things that distinguishes John's book certainly from other books that are written in and easily available in English, is that John's starting point is, is, Marxists, is Marxism and the interests of the working class. So next up is Tings Chak. Tings is a researcher, artist and activist based in Shanghai. She is an extremely busy person leading the art department at the Tricontinental Institute, along with also doing research work for Tricontinental, co-editing Dongsheng News, and writing for People's Dispatch. Tings has led the research and writing of Tricontinental's dossier on China's successes in poverty alleviation, which is due to be released later this month, I believe. Take it away, Tings. Thank you very much for having me today. Um, I was thinking about what I could share and then I revisited my red notebook here filled with notes. Um, from the first time I had a chance to listen to John's lecture just a few months after moving to Shanghai last year. So congratulations to John and the book, or should I say Luo Siyi, who, which is what you're known here in China as. Um, and, and I think, and thank you for your work in general, because it's been fundamental for many of us in helping us understand China from a Marxist econo uh, economic perspective. Um, and primarily that China is in fact a socialist country in the process of socialist construction and hasn't ceased to be in its uh, 70, I guess, two year process now. And, and nowhere can we see that more clearly than in the process of the struggle against poverty. And for purely selfish reasons, I know that we at Tricontinental have been really glad that this book got published right in this moment because in just under two weeks, we're about to launch a, um, a study on the poverty alleviation process called Serve the People, China's Eradication of Extreme Poverty. And of course, in it, we, we were able to um, um, kind of use the work that, that John has done to help us in the process. And I wanted to share a little bit about that process and, and how John's work in this book has helped us. Not only has John been a very generous advisor on the project, but the book itself has been very, very informative in that process. Um, and so, I mean, we've already talked about it um, in the event so far, um, and that, you know, when we're talking about poverty alleviation, one of the big numbers that comes up is, is 853 million people, 76% of global reduction since the opening of form uh, period. And John's book really helps us understand that this is not a departure from socialism, but a continuation based on, as Kenny was saying this, we are understanding that um, China was and continues to be in the primary stage of socialism. Um, and the fundamental question of that period was to how to develop the productive forces quickly, integrate into the world economy, reintroduce, which required a reintroduction of private capital, but not in the dominant sense. I mean, till today we see, I mean, we're seeing very recently how much uh, the government is reeling in the excesses of capital, taking on big tech in a real way. Uh, it is a continuation of the fact that yes, a capitalist class does exist in China, but capitalism uh, as a process is not what is dominant. And political power has actually never been transferred to the hands of capitalists. Um, and in that process, of course, the you know 
economic floor was lifted for the vast majority of Chinese people at an impressive speed. And, and what, what John's book does is it helps us understand that this massive economic growth of the uh, post-reform period is not apart from, but thanks to the social and economic gains of the pre-reform period, and that is under Mao. And we've already, um, many of the comrades here have already talked about uh, um, that, that, that uh, statistic uh, that in economic terms that John often cites in, in terms of understanding where the situation was for China in the founding of the PRC. Uh, in GDP per capita terms, China was the 11th poorest country. I mean, that's a very evocative reminder of the impact of imperialism, what this you know century of imperialism meant for China, how could a country that used to be 25% of the global economy um, at the you know early 19th century fall to just 5% at, around the time of 1949. And of course, losing 30 million lives just in the Second World War, not, not you know, counting for all the numbers of people that you know, died as other uh, impacts of imperialism. So the social gains that of this period, we can't understand this poverty alleviation without understanding social gains of that period. You know, um, we've already mentioned healthcare, education, literacy, um, you know, uh, adding a year or more than a year of lifespan to average person's life for every year of the revolution. I mean, these are incredible kinds of numbers to think about. And technologically and from a side of productive capacity, it's important to remember that in 1949, China couldn't even domestically produce a car. And by 1970, they sent a satellite up to space. And as a fun fact, you know, the, the satellite called Dongfang Hong, which many people will know, East is Red. Uh, but lesser known is that the East is Red actually sent, uh, that played the song, the same revolutionary song name, while it was orbiting in space during its 28 days out in the outer space. So I think that's just brilliant little fun fact. So when she comes to power in 2013, you know, we see this, you know, he says that he spent more time on poverty alleviation than anything else. And, and I believe it. Um, you know, it continues on this multi-decade process. Um, and that is the core of the focus of our study is looking at the targeted poverty alleviation period. Because China is actually a really dynamic place. It learns, it tests, it innovates, it makes mistakes, corrects, um, as good Marxists do. Um, and so this targeted phase is a accumulation of this uh, decades long process. And I think there's three things I wanna just point out of what made this a very um, specific and interesting thing for us, especially those of the South to learn from. The first is that it was multi-dimensional in character. Um, not only income, we've already talked about, you know, World Bank standards, it was higher than World Bank, that is, is, is the income side, but it wasn't an income distribution project. It was based on, you know, two other key factors, which is the, what is called the two assurances. You don't have to worry about food and clothing. And also the three guarantees, housing with clean water, running water, electricity, um, uh, basic healthcare, and then education that here in China is nine years uh, free and, and compulsory. The second factor is uh, the mobilization of the whole society, obviously under the leadership of the party, but this includes the state-owned enterprises, the private sector, civil society. You know, you have huge amounts of mobilization, making sure that the Eastern um, richer, but more developed uh, places are partnered with the lesser developed Western ones. You have massive training and dispatching of medical professionals, reminding us of the barefoot doctor days, teachers, experts, students to the countryside for years at a time. And I think number three, and probably the most important aspect is aspect of party building or rebuilding a party organization at the grassroots level. Um, I mean, the numbers just came out after last week's centenary, and it was amazing to be here in China for that. Um, the, the party is 95.1 million members. So if the party was a country, it'd be the 16th most, po most populous country in the world. It is a massive organization. But in this process of the poverty alleviation, what was key is sending 3 million cadre down to the countryside who live in very modest conditions for years at a time, literally knocking on the door of every single poor person in this country, um, of this hun remaining 100 million where, you know, the deepest pockets of poverty were, you know, market reforms or, um, you know, large scale development led poverty alleviation couldn't really touch. You're talking about communities that might be living off of a cliff, um, really remote areas that were very, very difficult to reach to. 
um, there, for every family, there was a cadre assigned and for every village, there was a team assigned. So this level of organization and massive amounts of, let's say, grassroots uh, democracy and practice uh, really took place to make this happen. And, and um, just wrapping up here is that in this study, we had a privilege to visit uh, Guizhou, which is one of the historically poorest provinces, very ethnically diverse, ecologically rich, and extremely mountainous. And so we went to the mountains and to seek truth from facts, as John really likes to say. And we got to meet party cadre, peasants in the villages, business owners, um, people who, who were lifted out of poverty, but most importantly, lifted themselves out of poverty in the process. It was about creating the conditions in which people could actually lift themselves and maintain uh, and ensure that they can be uh, stay out of poverty. And to witness many processes, programs, um, and, and how it actually happened was, I think, a huge, um, a huge privilege. And, and, and I encourage everyone when it comes out on the 23rd, which is the historic date of the centenary of the co first Congress of the CPC when it comes out. Um, but it's a real honor, I think, to be able to share some thoughts and learn from John and to be able to use a lot of what he's learned studying China all these years. Uh, towards uh, a project that can share more stories from China. So congratulate John on publishing the book and on this year of the centenary of the CPC. And thank you all for, for organizing this webinar. Thank you so much, Tings, for that contribution. And it's so important that people, like Tings says, make an effort to understand Chinese socialism. Like the Chinese themselves are really clear on that and they've they've actually never stopped explaining their ideological and their political orientation and framing that within socialism and, 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 and explaining where their practice fits into that. But especially Western leftists have a bad habit of not listening and instead of, of sort of projecting their own experiences and their dogma onto China. Um, so if we can help reverse that tide, that will, be, that will be great progress. So next up we have Vijay Prashad, who is perhaps known to a few of you. Um, another very bu busy person, Vijay is executive director of the Tricontinental Institute. He's chief editor of Left Word Books. He's chief correspondent for Globetrotter. He's written at least a million books and at least a billion articles. He's also a powerful public speaker and I'm sure he'll have something interesting to say to us. Go for it, Vijay. Um, thanks a lot, Carlos. It's great to be here and it's super to follow Tings, my colleague and comrade. Uh, John, it's a really good book and congratulations for it. Uh, it's, uh, you know, the second time that Radhika and I have the pleasure of talking about this book in public. Uh, and I could talk about this book another five times. So congratulations. Um, I want to spend a little time talking about India and China um, together and look at the comparison as it were. But I want to start with a book published in China in uh, early 1955. It was called The High Tide of Chinese Socialism uh, in the Countryside. And in the beginning of the book, Mao writes something that I have used to write in my notebook when I was younger. Uh, he writes, and I better read it so I don't miss it. He writes, don't lose touch with the people. Be adept at recognizing their enthusiasm from its very essence. It's an interesting idea. Um, be in touch with their enthusiasm. That's the word that Mao uses. And I want to come back to that in a minute. I'm going to quickly make about eight points. The first point, and I'm doing this like a runaway train, Carlos, so I, I don't uh, irritate you too much. The first point is that the Chinese revolution in 1949 was in a sense a Leninist revolution. Um, and I'm going to explain what that is in about five points. Firstly, it was a revolution in the colonized world. It followed basically the colonial and national theses of the Communist International of 1920. Just remember that there was no German revolution, that the revolutions didn't take place um, in the West, in North America, in Europe, and so on. The revolutions took place in the wretchedly backward parts of the world, you know, like, for instance, in the Tsarist Empire, a massive internal colony, huge parts of Asia, under you know essentially European colonialism, it took place in um, in China in 1949, Vietnam 1945, Cuba 1959, Burkina Faso 1983. Didn't take place in the United Kingdom or well I don't know if it's United or even a kingdom, but whatever that island is that had the 
a bad taste to come and colonize us in India. But still, it was, in a sense, a revolution in a colony. Second, it put national liberation as the first principle, in other words, to secure the territory from imperialism. Not an easy task when China had been under a war from 1937, essentially to 1949. Not easy to secure the territory. Uh, third, enhance the lives of the people through the basic means of socialist planning and organization, as well, as well as the transformation of land relations. I'll come back to that land relation question. So land reform, enhancement of health and education as priorities. This is an essential part of the Leninist agenda, which Mao takes full, full and directly implements it in China. Next, build the productive forces and socialized labor. This is the essence of John's book. He argues about um, building the productive forces, socializing labor. We are not Marxists who believe in socializing poverty. And so this point is essential. And John makes the point very clearly that you have to focus on how we build the productive forces, how that process socializes labor. And then the final point on Leninism is be patient in the protracted struggle to develop socialism in the world including through the long-term process of cultural transformation, something that Marxists tend to ignore. Our cultures have to be transformed. You know, uh, we come from societies with a great wretchedness in our cultural relations, caste, feudalism of the worst kind. This has to be transformed. It doesn't happen with an ax. It has to take place with a feather. It takes place over time. Now, China liberated itself at the same time as India became independent. Um, this is happening at the same time. Both enter the 1950s in a very similar situation. Extremely low levels of literacy, under 20% in both. India, in fact, enters 1947 at a 14% literacy rate. Extraordinarily low. So many hundreds of years of colonialism. Thanks for your civilization. You know, honestly, it was really helpful. It gave us 14% literacy rate. China also under 20%. Um, very poor health outcomes for the population. The agrarian question is posed in both places. I think this is important. It's not as if in India the agrarian question isn't put on the table. Um, since the peasantry is the largest section of the population in both countries. In India, the social relations are largely untouched. In other words, landlordism is largely untouched. There are modest forms of land reform. They are on the table, but not always implemented. In China, on the other hand, the agrarian reform law of June 1950 makes a fundamental change in the social relations of production. These reforms are finished by 1952. And China moves to cooperatives. It broke the link, essentially, between land, landlessness and poverty. This is something that continues to grip India till today. India's bourgeois landlord state promoted agrarian reform through technological inputs, largely the Green Revolution. You see, the failure of agrarian reform in India, and this is important, meant that collective structures to enhance employment and deliver, deliver social welfare were not available. You see, when you conduct land reform, the point isn't just to conduct land reform and individualized holding. You have to create collective structures that can deliver health care, education, you know, literacy, and so on. Those collective structures were not built in India. Um, in China, in the early decades of the revolution, it was collective rural structures that delivered health care and education. Every member of a commune, for instance, received rural health insurance and was treated by, as things mentioned, by barefoot doctors and the cooperative medical scheme. See, China pioneers mass scale public health and builds upon the Soviet experience. Just remember, guys, that the Soviet Union comes into being, the Soviet Republic actually, comes into being during the massive influenza epidemic, the Spanish flu. And the Soviets per force had to pioneer mass health care. It was extraordinary what the Soviets did in 1918, 19 and 20. Totally extraordinary. The Chinese learned from that. Many Soviet doctors come into China in the 1950s and help build the mass structures of rural health care. The combination of Soviet doctors and this trust the enthusiasm of the people is key. China's pioneering of mass scale primary health care, public health was so significant that it was treated as the model at the 1978 World Health Organization meeting in Alma-Ata. 
one of the most significant meetings and friends i'm going to ask you to go and read the alma ata declaration on the importance of primary health care it's actually very significant for this permanent covid period in which we're living in so i really want you to go and read the alma ata declaration it's built off of the experiences in china uh, from 1949 to 1978 Primary health care came alongside mass sanitation campaigns. You know, you've got to understand this. In our parts of the world, building mass sanitary campaigns are really important because you've got to break the epidemiological, you know, barriers that are posed for people. In India today, the most important ways in which, uh, not important, the, the most Common ways in which people in rural India die are essentially preventable because these have to do with questions of basic public health and sanitation. If you could do this, you would be able to get past this epidemiological barrier that, that strikes at the Indian peasantry. Um, there is no reversal of this in India. In China, you see a reversal. These campaigns in the early 1950s of getting rid of pests, of getting rid of just cleaning the streets and so on. You know, very important in India, you don't have this. You have, you know, plague returning in India, in Gujarat, uh, within uh, living memory in the early 1990s. The five guarantees were not distributed through the central government. They were distributed also through the communes, uh, played a big role, food, fuel, clothing, education, and burial. Um, these five guarantees over time will keep getting enhanced as people's expectations rise. Just some numbers, friends, just to give you a sense of this. Infant mortality, which to my mind is a really good way to understand um, the li lives of people because it also brings women's health into the picture. Infant mortality. In China in uh, 1997, there were 38 infant, you know, in, in, the infant mortality was 38 per thousand live births. In India, it was 71, basically almost double of that. Um, it was infants with low birth in China in 1997 is 9%. In India, it was 33%. Um, infant mortality decline in China was 5.4% from 1949 to 1985. In India, it was 1.3%. So you can see India just is unable to get a grip on some of these basic issues of human life and human dignity. Uh, human dignity. To lose a child that's born is one of the great traumas of, of human life. And I think to eradicate let me use that hard word eradicate infant mortality as much as possible should be a socialist goal uh, because that kind of trauma really impacts communities and so on education very quickly carlos i know i have about a minute to go education in the case of india while efforts have been made to improve literacy its literacy rate in 2011 was 74 percent well below that of China, which is over 95%. In fact, India's literacy level is even less than China's was in 1990. I mean, I'm saying all this because I'm not, not trying to take away at all from you know, the struggles in India and the important advances made in India. But the key issue was the socializing of relations of production in the countryside in that early period. Land reform, then the delivery of health and ed education resources and so on through collective structures that breaks the chain for china it breaks the chain from the hideousness of our pasts let's not exaggerate that we inherit hideous pasts with terrible hierarchies in india we haven't broken that yet and it shows us that it takes socialism to break that chain it takes socialism to break that chain capitalism is very comfortable with adopting old hierarchies and reproducing them and allowing old hierarchies to become the forms of power and domination in our society that's the argument for socialism you want an argument for socialism it's those statistics from china on health and education and john has all of this in his book thanks a lot Thank you very much, Vijay. Uh, a good tactic there. When you had minus two minutes remaining, you said you've got one minute remaining. <laughs> it was very convincing. Um, but I appreciate your efforts to keep within time. Um, and some really important points there, including quite a lot of points that that aren't widely considered. We don't hear about a lot. I especially ap appreciated hearing something about the cooperation between the Soviet Union and China in those early years of socialist construction in China. I think the Sino-Soviet split left such incredible scars on the international socialist movement that we can forget that there were better times. So continuing with our theme of ridiculous overachievers, 
Next up, we have Radhika Desai. Radhika is Professor of Political Studies at the University of Manitoba. She is Director of the Geopolitical Economy Research Group, uh, which is one of the co-sponsors of this event. Her 2013 book, Geopolitical Economy, After US Hegemony, Globalization and Empire, is a must read for those wanting to understand how the modern world works. And I think it's reasonable to say, although she wouldn't like it, that she's one of the foremost Marxist economists in the world. So Radhika, take it away. After that introduction, I can only disappoint you. Um, I, I'm very happy, particularly, well, happy to be among all these friends, uh, some of whom I've spoken on the same panel as before, and also happy particularly to follow Vijay's very instructive um, uh, comparison of India and China, which I think if we, if really one wants to appreciate what China has achieved, which is the subject of John's book, the chief comparator is actually India. These are two large billion plus countries uh, that one is socialist and one is capitalist and there you have everything that needs to be said and uh, yeah and I also liked um, Vijay's emphasis on um, the the difference and, and the, the difference is summed up in a single word revolution one country made one and the other country had a uh, transfer of power, a negotiated transfer of power, which is, uh, yeah. Anyway, let me just talk directly about John's book, which I consider to be very important. So I'm also going to make a, a dozen or so points, hopefully quickly. And uh, Carlos, you can go ahead and remind me when I'm at eight minutes. But so John, I think is a very uniquely qualified to write this book about China's economic achievements for a number of reasons. Um, he speaks from a long engagement with China, going back to his university days uh, with the communist world in general, uh, because he has also taken a deep interest in the fate of the Soviet Union. And of course, he has been particularly engaged with Chinese affairs over the last several decades, uh, which have been so critically important. He keeps uh, his finger on uh, the pulse of Chinese opinion, as, uh, as, as seen in his enormous Weibo following. Um, his um, uh, engagement with Chinese affairs is very consistent because he blogs on it on his learning www.learningfromchina.net blog. Um, and he has also speaks from very deep uh, knowledge of the Marxist tradition, of Marxist thinking more generally, including uh, in its development in China. Um, and he is as much at ease with, with Marxism and sort of Marxist political economy as he is with Western economic uh, 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 trends and, and, and so on. And I would say, most importantly, I think he approaches his subject with enormous political acuity. He, he seems to always unerringly identify what is at stake. And I think that's quite important. And finally, on a slightly frivolous point, I think that his book is packed with wonderful uh, statistics and graphs and charts, which I think are worth contemplating and which the publishers have produced very beautifully in color. So, so that, that's why John, we, I think that the, why we should read John's book. And John, as everybody has said, he argues basically that China has developed since it, the revolution because it is socialist. And this is very critically important to underline because if there is one fault that the left has, most of the left, the Western left and following it, the left in most other parts of the world, of the capitalist world, is that it pays no attention to production. It assumes that capitalism is this Promethean system of production, which is going to bring the productive forces up to the level that they should be. But as I've emphasized in my own work in geopolitical economy, and many other people have emphasized as well, the best development, the most the, 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 the most consistent development has taken place precisely when capitalism has deviated from it. The golden age of capitalist growth was the statist proto-socialist era of capitalist growth. And this is particularly, John's point about socialism being economically successful is particularly important at a time when you can clearly say capitalism is losing its mojo. Capitalism is no longer capable of growth. For the last decade plus, it has been, growth has been bumping along the bottom and throughout the 40 years of neoliberalism, when capital was given every freedom it wanted in the hope that it was going to, you know, become, you know, Re regain its vigor, 
None of this has happened. Every passing decade has registered lower growth than the decade before, as far as the capitalist world is concerned. And these facts are completely forgotten by the left. The left seems to live in a kind of a, a illusionary thinking that capitalism will solve the problem of production. And all we are going to have to do then is enjoy the happy task of redistributing what capitalism has produced. This is complete nonsense. The only way in which growth has taken place around the world is through planned development in China has shown just how much planned development can do precisely because of the depths of poverty from which it has brought the Chinese people into at, at, at a level of what today President Xi calls moderate prosperity. Of course, there are some things that John says that I, I mean, I, I don't agree with everything John says. I don't agree. Uh, John and I estimate US power differently. I think it's considerably lower than John uh, thinks. And certainly, I don't think that US military power testifies to its strength. I'm not, I'm no fan of purchasing power parity statistics. I don't agree with his criticisms of the USSR. Um, I wouldn't quite use the word globalization in the way that he does. I would actually demarcate very clearly what China means when it talks about globalization and what it means in the West, which is basically various forms of economic subordination. And theoretically, I wouldn't say that China's development makes equal sense, whether thought of in terms of Marxism and in terms of Western economics. On the contrary, John engages in a bit of a sleight of hand because as, as Western economics, he takes Keynesian economics, which I consider to be a major critic of the dominant form of Western economics. But nevertheless, I would say these differences are drops in a vast ocean of agreement. So let me focus on that. I, I think that I've, I've already said John does the great service of arguing that China's success is due to its socialism. Um, and this goes against the mainstream view that China is authoritarian and neoliberal and much of the Western left, which tends to concur with this. And, uh, and he does so with an excellent contribution of sort of theory and, and, and practice. John also recoups the Mao era, and I think this is very important because far too many people would like to argue, particularly Western mainstream media would like to argue that China has succeeded because it has become capitalist. No, China remains socialist and the previous Mao era was critical to its success. He counters neoliberals in China itself by insisting that China is socialist and must remain so if its success is to continue. And I will return to this point in a minute. He places China also in the longer history of the world's development by comparing it, uh, comparing China's development with that of the European countries, other developing countries, and so on. Um, he emphasizes, of course, how China has learned from facts. And I think this is very critically important because if there's one reason why the Soviet Union failed where, where China has succeeded is the ability of the Chinese leadership to learn from facts, as, as he has emphasized. Um, now, so let me end with something that John says in the preface to his English edition. He says, if 84% of humanity living in developing countries could emulate what China has achieved, make the transition from very low to high living standards, a very large part of the problems facing humanity would be solved. He's absolutely right, of course, but it is easier said than done. What is key to this effort is to make the revolution that China has made. That is what gives China the capacity, gives China's government and party the capacity to direct society in such a way and to achieve so much through that. So this need to make, uh, and, and so the, the, the revolution has to be strong enough to keep domestic legitimacy and strong enough also to resist imperialism. And this is, as I say, not very easy, but two things definitely help. Contributions like John's, which penetrate through the fog of Western imperialist propaganda and also Eurocentric leftist views and create and recreate the understandings out of which revolutions are made in the rest of the world as well. And secondly, there is an objective weakening of uh, imperial power that makes um, that, 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 that makes uh, 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 the, the such revolutions easier. And of course, though, that does not mean that uh, uh, the contradictions of Western imperialism are not going to stand in the way, but I think that that should also help. So nowhere is this weakening more apparent than in John's suggestion that we think of the current period of China's development 
uh, uh, as the, sorry, as the current period, as the period of China's development of socialism, just as once we thought of history in terms of the Soviet development of socialism. And I think the fact that such thinking can return shows that imperialism is once again being beginning to be held at bay. And I think that's very important. So to, to really conclude, I think works are, like John's are important uh, also within China, because make no mistake, as various people have already pointed out, there is still political struggle in China. And there will remain so until China becomes communist in some sense. So if the, if the neoliberal right wins in China, then many of China's wonderful achievements are bound to be reversed. So reminders like John's, also ensure that the domestic class struggle uh, within China is, 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 is the outcome of the domestic class struggle will be to keep socialism in power in China and to continue to make the strides that he talks about both within China and in the rest of the world, which of course John's very good discussion of China's foreign policy also illuminates how China plays a role in that. So with that, I'll uh, end there. Thank you very much. That's excellent, Radhika. Thank you very much. Um, and, you know, in addition to the commendation of the book, as I said at the start, I think it's really useful to hear about some of the differences in relation to economics. And, and you know, you're, you're right to say that comparatively to the areas of agreement on the big issues, these differences are relatively minor. But nonetheless, there's actually a huge amount that we can all learn and the audience can start to learn as well through engaging in these types of discussions. So I think that's really useful. So our last panelist is Josh Jackson. Josh is very humble and won't let me say anything nice about him. Uh, but the main thing you need to know is that he is a left-wing political activist from Britain and a strong proponent of cooperation with China. He also wins the prize for the best background by quite some distance. He's got the greats there. He's got Karl Marx, he's got Friedrich Engels, he's got Xi Jinping and and John Ross, <laughs> so, <laughs> illustrious company indeed. Um, you Thank can you. find some of his Thank best you. work on Twitter, uh, Joshua Y. Jackson. I'll post that in the chat. Go for it, Josh. Thank you. Uh, greetings and comradely welcome to all attendees. My thank you to our organisers and the other speakers for their excellent contributions. And I must say, I feel somewhat underqualified considering I'm not a director or a professor of anything, uh, but I'm very happy to be here. I need not repeat the heaps of praise piled atop Mr. Ross's book, for I share them wholeheartedly. Let me say clearly, the question of China is unavoidable. Her critical position in the global economy and international system make this so. Therefore, it is equally unavoidable that all manner of opinions on China arise. These opinions range from the genuine, well-meaning and research commentary to the bad faith, anti-communist and lazy stereotypes that have become all too common. Therefore, I will say plainly, if you wish to understand the very fundamental conditions that have made China the power it is today, it would be a much simpler task to throw out nearly every other book written by a Westerner and pick up this one book by John Ross. This is a man who not only has a deep and intimate understanding of China, but he understands China in the way that they themselves do. It is a perspective which allows John to act for us as the non-Chinese as a bridge into their understanding. This book will answer many of the questions that you have about China. Now that I hope my endorsement of this book is clear, I would like to sort of use my remaining time to contribute to this discussion by explaining, as this book does, the necessity of claiming China's advances in the name of socialism and Marxism, uh, Marxism and to do that sort of express the spirit of this book, uh, which is contained in perhaps my favorite chapter, which is the third chapter, which is uh, China as a socialist country in line with Marx. I would ask you to cast your mind back 100 years to this exact month in Shanghai, China, the first national Congress of the Communist Party would still be ongoing. At this meeting, there was 12 people representing 50 party members alongside two representatives from the Communist International. Um, the final day of that meeting actually had to be held on a cruise ship because they were being sort of harassed in their original location by like uh, French colonial authorities. Um, the line laid down by that Congress was one of revolution. However, they had a daunting task ahead of them. China carved up by foreign imperialists, riven by 
warlords and a feudal system uh, where landlords held power of life and death over hundreds of millions of peasants who were kept in destitution and an economy that had once been the greatest in the world was reduced to among the very poorest. Yet return your mind to the present. China has a rover on Mars, her own space station launched after the US kicked her out of uh, space cooperation, and China is now the world's preeminent economic power. Domestically, the lives of Chinese people have undergone a hitherto unseen transformation, the life expectancy of nearly a fifth of the world's population, actually over a fifth of the world's population, has uh, doubled and over 800 million people have been lifted out of poverty, which is the largest reduction in history. So what happened? And to answer that question is not only for the sake of historical clarity, but to help ourselves because we still suffer from poverty, inadequate and unequal development, and particularly in the global south. For me, the importance of China to world socialism is that China answers the questions of the challenges of socialism, which are to develop the productive forces faster than capitalism, to develop productivity faster than capitalism, to deliver higher living standards than what capitalism, uh, capitalism can deliver, and to achieve a greater national strength and meet people's needs better than Western models. And I think China shows that this is entirely possible. Uh, to explain why we should absolutely claim this for Marxism and why this is very much in line with Marx, I would like to uh, say a quote by this great man behind me, Mr. Friedrich Engels, uh, who wrote once, and I quote, communism is for us not a state of affairs which is to be established and an ideal which reality will have to adjust itself. Rather, we call communism the real movement which abolishes the present state of things. So it is not, it's by not understanding this quote, which has led a lot of people to confusion about China's model, because for a lot of people, uh, they view socialism as sort of a fixed ideal, a fixed sort of state of affairs, uh, one particular model, which may be for a lot of people what the Soviet Union had at one point in history, uh, as opposed to seeing socialism as a process, as something which emerges from capitalism, which emerges from the contradictions of capitalism and contains many of the hallmarks of capitalism. So obviously when people who are not familiar with sort of the Marxist methodology, when they see China, they are confused because they, because it has not yet reached uh, the highest level of socialism, yet it is still undergoing that socialist process, the one described by Marx and Engels. It has to be understood socialism as something which emerges dialectically and not something which is merely established overnight. So in this spirit, we can say China is undoubtedly a socialist country. It was Deng Xiaoping who once said, we cannot expect Marx to provide ready-made answers to questions that arise over a hundred years after his death. A true Marxist-Leninist, he said, must understand and carry on and develop Marxism-Leninism in light of the current situation. Uh, Marx and Engels emphasized repeatedly throughout their works that they were not writing dogmas to be repeated, but they were writing a living theory. And it was Lenin who summarized this best when he said, we do not regard Marx's theory as something completed and inviolable. On the contrary, we are convinced that it has only laid the foundation stone of a science that socialists must develop in all directions if we wish to keep pace with life. And this is what China has done. Therefore, as socialists, we must, as John rightly said, emancipate our minds and seek truth from facts. And that is to say that China's road and the line of the Communist Party of China is consistent with the principles and methodology of Marxist theory. And it was and it's figures like Mao Zedong, Deng Xiaoping and Xi Jinping, which have added to and advanced this theory. China, as John explains in the book, adheres to the primary stage of socialism. This is a theory which regards the stages of socialist development that a socialist society undergoes. These principles were laid down by Marx in the critique of the Gopher program, and they were also explained by Lenin. With its revolution, China established a political base for socialism, yet uh, a per people's uh, democratic dictatorship, yet obviously the economic system of socialism is something which emerges over a long period of time, Lenin wrote that socialism, the transition from capitalism to socialism, takes place over an entire historical epoch. And 
I think that's really what this book can help us understand that historical epoch, that journey under which China is going and why it is indeed a Marxist journey and why it's so important for us to claim it for Marxism and not allow reactionaries to claim it for capitalism, because this is one of the greatest victories in human history for prosperity. It must be ours. And to sort of end, I want to end on a quote from Xi Jinping, who said this, we should have a deep understanding of the dialectical relationship between the long-term goal of communism and the common ideal of building socialism with Chinese characteristics. The communist ideals would be no more than empty talk without our efforts to develop Chinese socialism and rejuvenate the Chinese nation. Our confidence in the path, theory, system, and culture of socialism with Chinese characteristics can ultimately be condensed into faith in socialism and Marxism. And yes, so that's the point I would like to make. And yes, thank you for having me and thank you for letting me speak and buy this book. Very good. That's great. Many thanks, Josh. And this idea of Marxism as a living science rather than some sort of religious canon is, is really key. And I think to a significant degree, it's the failure to treat Marxism as a living science that perhaps renders people seemingly incapable of understanding China's creative contributions to Marxism over the course of the last 100 years. Um, so that wraps up the presentations. Inevitably, we don't have much time left, but if people don't mind going on a little bit longer, what I suggest we do is have just a round of contributions from the panelists in response to the discussions and the Q&A, um, like maybe kind of two to three minutes each. And that would be in the order in which people spoke. So. Kenny, Tings, Vijay, Radhika, Josh, and then uh, John coming in for a few minutes for the final word. Um, I don't know if people have access to the Q&A um, for the question, so I'll just quickly read a few out or, or summarize a few of them. William asks a question around, what, what role does the propaganda war on China play in international relations today? Um, Cynthia asks a question around, you know, what, what, what would you respond to those that claim that China's success is due primarily to the Confucian nature of her culture? Um, and also Cynthia asks, how can we assess if a country is socialist or not? And are there differences with the, the advanced welfare, welfare states in Scandinavia? Harald asked, does it even matter what the West thinks anymore? You know, China can build a BRI, um, it can, integrate economically with pretty much all of the developing world, are we at a stage where we can basically ignore the West? Um, Zach asks if somebody could discuss the situation of labor relations in China, what's, what's China like in terms of workers' rights? Um, Mike asks if people could say something about the astonishing growth of the capitalist countries of Taiwan and South Korea in terms of the advanced technology sectors. And an anonymous attendee asks, uh, what is transferable from the China experience to the development of other countries in the global south? Um, so those are the questions that have appeared in the q and I think there might be a few more, but um, I, I, I might, I'll, I'll just ask people to, I'll ask the panelists to take a look at the Q&A box if, if they have access to that. So, um, Kenny, do you want to come in for a couple of minutes? Okay. Um... I think one point um, I might take uh, Rob's question about the NEP and, and so on. I think it's very important that we have some understanding of, um, and, and both uh, Radhika and, and John himself mentioned this, the, the, the pre-78 period. Um, I mean, I know Carlos, you wrote fantastic series for the Morning Star on the, the historical developments of the, of the CPC. But the developments that happened in China in the 1950s are quite, quite remarkable. Um, I mean, China achieved some of its highest GDP figures in the mid 50s. And um, I quoted in, in one of the pamphlets that I, I wrote, um, a, a very important speech that, um, that Mao made in uh, 1954 when the, the, the discussion about the Chinese constitution was being made. Um, so I think we can we can actually look beyond Lenin's NEP. It's obviously fascinating and important to make those contrasts, but it would be I think more useful in a sense to also look at that period in the fifties when China was um, applying the, the the principles of the new democratic revolution. The period between 
49 and, and, and 56 in particular, the period when there was this uh, very open and uh, encouraging attitude towards the, the national bourgeoisie, uh, encouraging um, small businesses, handicrafts and so on, petty commodity producers uh, and so on. Um, as well, of course, as the as the land reform, the the land to the tiller um, kind of processes. So, um, whilst I think the NEP is important and it's it's useful to to use that, um, because there are there are people who are very um, unfamiliar with uh, Chinese economic developments. Um, I think it's better uh, to actually look at. Um, that period, that period between the revolution in 49 and the adoption of the Great Leap Forward, that's a, that seems to me to be a very, very uh, fruitful area of, of discussion and re research. Um, and I, I think that's something that um, people have got access to, to Mao's writing and uh, perhaps some of the, the works of Deng Xiaoping and Zhou Enlai are also available from that period. I think that's an incredibly important uh, component of, uh, the, of the wider discussion, because I think it shows the continuity of the CPC as well as the, you know, the, the breaks that happened. It shows a, a certain return to, return to the source. That's my point. That's great. Thank you very much, Kenny. Tings, are you able to come in for a short contribution? Yeah, maybe I'll just, you know, on the question about Confucianism is that um, I think there's kind of various levels of how we understand China, you know, a new China uh, in terms of under the socialist um, phase under the CPC. But obviously we can discount that China is also a civilization state, you know, even understanding what is the big prospect, you know, the words that we use for understanding um, the shared future for humanity draws upon a long history around Confucianism and the idea of Datong. So these things I don't think are con uh, contradictory, but uh, it doesn't negate the fact that this is a 5,000 year history um, that, that, that um, from the time of great leaders like Mao till today um, needs to speak into the pop in the popular voices of many people. So I think as a quick answer to that, um, there there is a Confucius nature, I guess, but not but not the the root of the success of of, of what we see today. Very useful, thank you, Tings. Uh, Vijay, are you there? Yes, of course, right here, present. Great. Uh, and so, yeah, go ahead. And so um, the question that I found interesting is the one of well. Can a country like China just say, well, you know, we, we don't care what people in the West say and we're just doing our own thing. I mean, look, um, that's not possible <laughs> for many reasons. Uh, and it's not possible for one, because the West has imposed um, a hybrid war on China. It includes an information war, but also a war against uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. This is a direct confrontation, a contest. It's a military engagement with the HMS. Queen Elizabeth is her name, uh, sailing now up the Philippines towards um, the Chinese coastline. Um, this is an imposed war. You can't just say, well, just turn your backs on the West. Doesn't matter what they say. They are, they are actually imposing a physical and ideological war against China. And in a sense, not only against China, but against the third world. Why against uh, much of the third world? Because um, you know, they're contesting BRI and trying to reaffirm the IMF development and austerity strategy in Africa, in, in Latin America and Asia and so on. Uh, that's the contest. It's between the IMF and the BRI. And so you can't just say, let's just avoid what the West says. I mean, you have to contest it. Uh, the West is very powerful in the circuits of information. The West is very powerful in the circuits of ideology. Um, you know, it's powerful within China. It's not just powerful outside China. Uh, it has to be confronted and the confrontation has to be sophisticated. It has to be credible and it has to demonstrate the kind of interests that lie behind this hybrid war. You know, it's not a random thing. Yes, there are circuits of, of racism involved here, but also there is genuine economic interest. There is a fear that if China develops in the tech and science um, you know, sectors as it has, that it will overrun as it is already doing 
uh, important sectors of uh, of the intellectual property generators in the United States and in Western Europe and so on. And this is therefore for these sectors an existential crisis. So they are not going to lift the pedal of the hybrid war against China, which means, you know, places like China can't just say it's not important. That's the reason why. That's the reason why China is part of the new group at the UN called the um, Group of Friends in Defense of the UN Charter, because they are trying to position themselves towards multipolarity, not unipolarity. So can you just ignore the West? I don't think so. And by the way, that's why John, Carlos and I are part of the No Cold War platform. Please go to NoColdWar.org, read the statement that we have, endorse and sign it, and please campaign for it in your various countries. Thank you, Vijay. Uh, strongly agree with that. And Josh, do you want to come in for a short contribution? Yeah, always make that mistake. Go down and meet yourself. Um, the first thing I want to say is I want to just briefly address the second part of Cynthia's question about state capitalism. This is something which I hear a lot on Twitter. People say that China is state capitalist, state capitalist, blah, 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 blah. And I think it shows a misunderstanding of what both socialism is and what state capitalism is. And to sort of clear it up, I want to share a quote from Lenin, which I often sort of reply uh, to people when they ask me about the relationship between state capitalism and socialism. So this is the quote. It's, uh, for socialism is merely the next step forward from state capitalist monopoly, or in other words, socialism is merely state capitalist monopoly, which is made to serve the interests of the whole people and has to that extent ceased to be capitalist monopoly. And I think China is a great uh, because in China, you know, monopoly does serve the interests of the whole people. We see this from the poverty alleviation campaigns. We see this from the fact that uh, Xi Jinping and the Communist Party often says that no one can be left behind in China's development. The rural people cannot be left behind and that the gaps between rich and poor must be closed and that they are mobilizing the entire state in order to do this. So I think, you know, saying that China is state capitalist sort of uh, betrays the idea that effectively socialism is merely sort of state capitalism turned on its head. And China is very much doing what Lenin said in the quote I just described. And the sort of second thing I wish to say is, uh, there was a question which says sort of China is, uh, you know, how does sort of the workers rule or something like that? And I think I want to encourage people to actually study how the system works in China because China has, and uh, I believe it is 2.7 million elected, uh, elected representatives at all levels of the country in the People's Congress system. And a lot of people don't know how China is governed, but they actually have loads of democratic organs. I would encourage people to research the People's Congress system. So from the national level down to sort of municipal, townships, cities, even sort of, you know, uh, you know, your communities, you can, they have like those people congresses and there's uh, direct elections and indirect elections. So China does have a democratic system within which uh, working class people can exercise state power. It's uh, written like the whole purpose of the People's Congresses are that they are the organs through which working class people can exercise power. So the idea that, and I think this is a comical idea, that the idea that it's just a few people sitting in one room that decides everything that happens in China is completely mistaken. In fact, it's millions of Chinese people, uh, both inside the Communist Party and outside of the Communist Party. I'd encourage people to research the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference to understand the very unique system of Chinese democracy, which is also a multi-party democracy. There are eight political parties in, in China, which all have representation. And I think the confusion is that they don't have an oppositional system. They have, and I think it's actually a very good system, a sort of a deliberative system where everyone ultimately has to come together. Uh, so it reaps the advantages of being united and not always having a system where everything is ultra polarized and everyone sort of fighting each other. So yeah, as I would say, I would encourage people to research how China is actually governed because I feel there is a lot of misconceptions and people do not know the actual extent of China's democracy and how its society operates. And yeah, that's what I'd sort of say. Thank you very much, Josh. And I definitely agree. There's um, lots of uh, misconceptions in relation to the nature of uh, China's system. Is it capitalist? Is it socialist? And it tends to narrow in on 
very specific technical issues about the sort of percentage of the economy which is in state hands and the percentage of the economy that's in um, private hands and so on. But it misses the most important question, which is about political power, which is that you know, in China, capital is not allowed to dominate political power. And that makes it not a capitalist country. And that's the most important thing. If, if capital were in control in China, China wouldn't be able to put its primary emphasis on poverty alleviation. It wouldn't be able to put its primary emphasis on containing the pandemic in the way that it has. It wouldn't be able to put its primary emphasis on um, ecological conservation and, and working to prevent uh, climate breakdown in the way it is. And it's, you know, it's, it's leading the world in, in all of those three key areas, which are answering you know, the, the biggest problems, the, the, ma the major questions that humanity faces at this time. Um, sorry, I messed up the order a little bit. Um, so I want to bring in Radhika uh, before we bring Josh, uh, John in for his final contribution. Yeah, Go thanks. Ahead, um, and, and thanks. And I've really enjoyed this. And I'm going to have actually a number of different reactions, but I'm going to confine myself to one set of points. It's about the development of uh, Taiwan, South Korea, etc. And, and generally speaking, uh, my, my point, which I always love to emphasize, too many people, mainstream economics in the West, as well as too much of Marxist economics, assumes that capitalism is a Promethean system. This is you know, profoundly productive, et cetera, et cetera. This is completely false. Just consider this. I've already said in my presentation that capitalism's most dynamic period was also its most statist period, the period during which, thanks to the existence of communism in the Soviet Union, in Eastern Europe, in China, it was forced to become more reform oriented, more welfareist. It was forced to bring up the consumption of its own working classes to a higher level than it had ever been before in the history of capitalism. And a couple of other points. If you are going to look at it, it, it was the existence, you know, this, uh, it was the existence of, of the Soviet Union, which forced Western Europe to grant welfare states, to pursue full employment, et cetera, in the hope that the working class, their working classes would not fall for the charms of communism. On the other flank, on the Eastern flank of the communist world, it was the Chinese revolution. It was its implementation of land reform that also forced Japan, South Korea and Taiwan to implement radical forms of land reform, which to this day account for their economic dynamism, their relative equality, their rel relatively high human development indices, et cetera, et cetera. So in all of these ways, socialism has both within itself and more broadly for the world has had a more profound influence on the ability of the world to develop the productive forces than capitalism has. And I think this point cannot be underlined more, particularly when capitalism is failing, because coming back to the point about propaganda and Western propaganda, yes, of course, we have to counter it. And as Vijay has rightly pointed out, it's more than propaganda, it's military aggression. That also has to be countered uh, in, in all ways possible. But remember, that West, Western capitalism's performance is now at such a low ebb that the ability of, or, or the credibility of our, our resistance to Western propaganda, our counterpoints uh, is greater. Our counterpoints are today more credible because of the lived experience of working people all around the world. Thanks. Thank you so much, Radhika. Uh, so John, it's back to you to respond to the contributions so far and to sum up. And if you can keep it to sort of five minutes-ish, I'll be a little bit liberal, but if you go beyond seven minutes, you're in trouble. Right, okay, firstly, I, I just want to repeat, and I'm not trying to be polite, I'm very honored for the people who came and speak, for everybody who came and attended, but also for particularly the people who spoke because this is part of an important dialogue which is taking place at many different levels between China and the world. And this is a big new thing, which indicates, as I say, we're entering into the, what I would call the Chinese period of the development of socialism, which doesn't mean that there won't be very, very many massively important struggles taking place, but they're all likely to end up or interact, intersecting with China. Just to give what was referred to no Cold War, um, Recently, No Cold War organized a meeting in Brazil, worked together with Tricontinental, which Dilma Rousseff, former president of Brazil, spoke. Uh, former president Lula of Brazil has done a widely viewed uh, 
interview in China on Guangzhou, which is viewed by hundreds of thousands of people, including Qing state officials. So there's a level taking place at what you might call leadership of mass forces between China and the West. There's a discussion which is taking place between um, socialist, um, I don't like the word intellectuals particularly, but nevertheless, we you know, socialist writers, socialist theorists, um, et cetera, the type of people who we've got here. But what we also have to understand with a little bit of humility that actually the Chinese left is very, very much better informed on these discussions than we are. We know very, very, you have to understand, we know very, very much less about China than China knows about the West, including the left in the West. Just to give you a few indications of this. If we take Guangzhou, because Guangzhou takes the, publishes the number of hits on each article. If you take the speakers here together, in less than the last year, they have had 3 million hits on articles on Guangzhou, translated into Chinese, 8 million hits on Weibo, which is the Chinese equivalent on Twitter, commenting upon these articles. And this is just a totally different scale to in, in the West. And as I say, Guangzhou itself gets tens of millions of hits each day. I, I also want to take up something and we need to get one of the things that we need to do, do is the west has to western left has to break with its arrogance and begin to understand that it has an enormous amount to learn from china uh, and then, then there are discussions uh, there are dis big discussions within the chinese left also um i want to take up something which um kenny said yes i, I take it extremely profoundly that the leaders of the Chinese Communist Party are Marxists and very great Marxists. There is much too much that goes on, not merely in the West, from the, um, the, the capitalist commentators, but also from the left, that they read books about Mao Zedong, or they read books by Deng Xiaoping, about, about Deng Xiaoping. I assure you, there are, there are 2,500 pages of Mao Zedong, which are available in English. Go read Mao Zedong. Go, go read a book about Mao Zedong. Or, well, at least that, you might well read a book as well, but go and read an original. Go read what Deng Xiaoping said. Go read what Xi Jinping says. That's real Marxist. And then follow. One of the great things now with modern software is you can follow the discussions on Marxist left. The first thing I do when I get up in the morning is I log into Chinese websites. I use Ch the translation software and you find out what's going up, going on in, in the situation in China. Okay. If I can say just one final thing, what does this mean? If you don't mind me having a personal, um, explain the personal experience. I've never doubted that it was the right thing to do in my life to be a socialist ever since I entered politics actually against the Vietnam War. I've never had the slightest doubt about it. But it's important to remember that socialism is about changing ordinary people's lives for the better. The thing which I, the, the biggest experience I ever actually had in my life in an emotional sense was actually in the Beijing Planning Museum. In the, it's an unusual place to have a big socialist experience of planning museum. I mean, it's the physical planning museum. I don't mean the economic planning. And there, there is the model of China, of, of Beijing, as it was in 1949. And almost the, big, the biggest buildings in Beijing at this time were the pagodas in the uh, Forbidden City. There were a few modern ones, but not very many. If you go to Beijing now, it, is, it makes New York look like an old fashioned place. In fact, one of the biggest experiences, as does Shanghai, uh, one of the biggest experiences was I flew from New York to Shanghai and I, I thought, you know, New York is, this is great for the, or great display of power, I don't like the capitalist system, for the 1930s and 1950s. If you go into Shanghai or Beijing, this is of the 21st century. And at that point I thought, my God, I haven't done the wrong thing with my life. That the people from, taken from Beijing to that in a uh, single lifetime is incredible, but then, when I thought about it, I realized I was underestimating this change. Imagine if I was a woman and a Chinese woman and, right, what would it mean, what does it mean to be a woman in China to be in the difference to a woman in India? If the question, to take Vijay's question, it means you live in China, you live six years longer if you're a woman in China than a woman in India. 
you are certain unless you're very very old to be literate whereas step around 30 percent of women in india are still illiterate you're twice as likely in india to die in childbirth if you go to a university about a quarter of the students in india india university students are women in china the majority 52 percent of students in university are women and even more astonishingly perhaps the majority of postgraduate students in india in china are women in other words the trajectory of life of a woman in china is just qualitatively superior to the quality of the trajectory of life for a woman in india and that's what socialism is about socialism together with the 853 million people taken out of poverty or the fastest rise in living standards in in the world that's what socialism is about it all the theory all the discussion everything in the end is to produce a better life for ordinary people and that's what china did has done and that's why we have to reply to all the lies and all the attacks in the West, because what the West is trying to do is trying to prevent the Chinese people continuing with this enormous development. And if they do, they will set back uh, the entire world. So that's, if the book can make the slightest contribution to understanding the relation between these theoretical questions and the improvements of life of other people, then I would be astonishingly pleased because we've never got to lose sight of this fact that what really socialism to do is to improve the lives of ordinary people and that's what china's done and thank you very very much for everybody who's come and uh, so for saying a lot of word kind words which i don't deserve so thank you very much indeed bye thank you very much john i think that uh, sums things up very well so that wraps up the proceedings today i think it's been a really valuable event and we've explored some very important ideas. I hope people will read John's book. I hope people will continue to engage with the ideas that it discusses. You know, the Chinese revolution is 100 years old now, the CPC having just celebrated its centenary, and it continues to evolve. It's, it's essential for Marxists to understand it. Actually, it's essential for everyone to understand it. China, along with the other socialist countries, is leading the way and blazing a trail towards a socialist future, a future where everybody's basic needs are met, a future in which people can enjoy peace and prosperity. So it's incumbent upon us to study and understand what's going on, to learn from China, learn from the socialist world, explain it to others, take that knowledge and inspiration into our own struggles, wherever we are, against capitalism, against imperialism, racism, climate breakdown, and all forms of oppression. So I wanna thank once again, the panelists, the attendees and the organizers, and I look forward to seeing you all again soon.